welcome to Heroes of the Coast, the program that brings you the personal stories of those who have dedicated their lives to protecting the California coast for the rest of us. My name is Janet Bridgers, Executive Director of Earth Alert, and I'm here today with Don May, President of Earth Corps, longtime environmentalist, and we're continuing our reminiscence uh, and documentation of some of the feats of the legendary Rimmon C. Fay, PhD, the man we all call Rim, who has been one of the most effective activists and scientists there have ever been in terms of protecting the coast. Don, welcome back. I'm delighted to be here and to get a chance to talk more, more about Rim. Rim's health does not permit him to tell his own story, and that's why we're telling these stories on his behalf. Mm -hmm. And uh, where we left off on part one, Don, we were talking about uh, Rim's role in San Onofre. And where we left off on the story, he had been elected to the California Coastal Commission after the passage of uh, Prop 20 that created the California Coastal Commission, and he was one of the commissioners who voted against San Onofre, cor correct? Key vote, the key vote, yes. And, uh, but it, did they, now they appealed or it went, it, we- They filed, filed a suit that, uh, that claimed that the testimony was improper. We were not able to get the record, the transcript of the hearing introduced or any of the statements of the commissioners. Court uh, judge uh, said, well, let them sort it out he didn't want to deal with it and sent it back to the same people. It's as if they voted that way, let them do it again. Mm -hmm. And what happened was one of the most intense uh, campaigns by Edison, who is probably one of the most powerful political organizations in the state, and uh, got the uh, uh, governor and the, and the speaker of the house and, uh, and folks to uh, really uh, uh, make it clear to the Coastal Commission that they would not continue, finish their uh, second year of existence if they didn't allow this power plant to come in on the coast. And so uh, they... Uh, Wait a minute. After one year after the creation of the, yeah, of the, of the Coastal Commission, they the governor and et cetera are threatening to shut it down. Oh, absolutely. On one issue. On one issue. Despite the fact that it was created by an initiative passed by an overwhelming margin by the people of California. That's exactly right. And it, it, was, a, it was a terrible time. Uh, the uh, commission, even though they would serve out their five years of existence under the, under the Coastal Act, if the legislature didn't give them any funds for mm -hmm. staff and for paying the rent mm -hmm. to hold hearings and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, they would not be able to exist. Uh, their offices, they had five regional offices as well as a state office, all requires a budget, still does. And it's uh, money well spent by anyone's estimation for what the Coastal Commission has been able to do this past uh, 40 years uh, in, uh, in protecting the coastline, protecting the uh, natural resources. And RIM was uh, a very, very key part uh, of providing the scientific basis for developing uh, one of the things that they had to do in, within the five years before it sunsetted out in 76 was to produce a plan for the California coast. Mm -hmm. They did that. First time I have ever seen that a uh, agency ever finished its job on time at, with not only within budget, with uh, money left over. Unfortunately, uh, the legislature uh, did not uh, see fit to use that plan once it was, uh, but the commission has continued and the regulatory authority, which of course is what everyone was concerned with, not the plan on how the coast is used. So RIM played a, uh, it's a 5,000 permits uh, a month though they, they processed for those years and uh, that's a huge amount and a lot of them were, uh, you know, small, but there were some big ones. Mm -hmm. There were, uh, RIM was, uh, helped us uh, defeat uh, uh, several uh, liquid natural gas LNG plants that, uh, and now here we are going through it all over again in California. Mm -hmm. uh, he helped us uh, 
He was the one that led the opposition to uh, desalination, to a, a whole lot of other things, as well as nuclear power. Let's take a break here, though, for a minute. Because that, that, that come, I, want, I, I want to offer our viewers a little bit of a, a, a lighthearted anecdote that you told me before we, when we finished the last show. Rim was also involved in some entertainment-related depictions uh, of the coast, okay? Rim, Rim is it's Steinbeck's uh, doc uh -huh. from Cannery Row, uh, whose real name is Ed Ricketts, was uh, uh, Rim's stereotype. Doc uh, had uh, Western Biological, a biological supply house. Rim had Pacific Biomarine. They looked a lot alike, and really? certainly they were, uh, Ed Ricketts was a conservationist of the day. So when uh, MGM got around to making the film Cannery Row, uh, they picked Rem as their consultant, and he made the, the, the query for the set and all of that. And he called me up one day out of the blue, says, uh, Don, go buy Wildflower Pizza in Santa Monica, pick up two pizzas of this exactly like this, and bring them up for lunch. It's worth your while, trust me. So I do, and I get waved past the front gate and back to the lot and down thin, here's this, and I walk out and here the set is uh, uh, Monterey Bay with the, with, the, with the pier that goes out, and uh, Rem sitting at the end uh, with Raquel Welsh, who was the lead, uh, <laughs> went dangling her feet in the water, and, and it turns out Wildflower Pizza is her favorite. So we got he to. He asked, huh? Yeah. He so he said, I'll have it delivered. <laughs> I know somebody who would be delighted to deliver that. And of course, he was quite right. Had an, <laughs> had an absolutely marvelous. Raquel, as it turns out, of course, was a little bit too headstrong. And they had to replace her by, what, I've forgotten the, the other. Uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> she's a very outspoken woman and a, just an absolute delight. And. Uh, Rem was uh, clearly delighted to. Uh, did and he consulted on some other. D did he not on some other uh, movies After that were made on along the coast? Too? Anytime you do something like Old Man in the Sea or mm -hmm. or that, you you had to pick Rem. I mean, he's uh, was uh, the uh, the the uh, not only the guy with uh, all the scrambled eggs on uh, on his all of the the ribbons and, and uh, degrees, but. Uh, the guy who really did know where everything was and what everything was going on on the coast. He, he would do things. We used to do fundraisers uh, down at the Malibu Colony with guys like Bob Weiss, that uh, was a, a well-known director of his time. Beautiful home down in Broad Beach. And uh, so we have all the folks there. Rem arrives, of course, by sea. That is to say, he takes his boat up, anchors it offshore, and swims to the party, <laughs> and comes and comes in with a dripping wet in his wetsuit, in with all of these uh, uh, Hollywood uh, glitterati. Uh, he did a lot of things like that. That was. Uh, it, it is worth saying that Rim was just about the most un is continued still the most unpretentious. Absolutely. Highly educated, literate, uh, well-spoken person I've ever met. But he loved a good joke too. We were locked in struggle with uh, with the L.A. County uh, Sanitation District over their practice of dumping sludge in the ocean and DDT. And uh, somehow we came up with the idea: that you know, if we collected the fish heads from all the fishing boats mm -hmm. and ground them up and did an extract, we could see wherever the fish were caught, and what kind of fish, and what time of day, and you get a whole lot of really important data. And of course, the sports fishing guys were really into this, and in nothing flat, we had truckloads of fish heads that were all properly tagged with where they'd come from, what boat, whereabouts, how, and we, uh, we're gonna reduce them down, mince all these old fish heads down, and put them in Rim's little sterile buckets, and we have his Pacific Biomarine has taken over. And uh, the uh, county, of course, uh, was pretty nervous about all of this and said, well, will you share the data? And uh, we said, well, uh, I tell you what, if you want, we'll give you splits. We'll take each thing, we'll split it in half, you analyze half, and we'll analyze half, and we'll compare the data, right? Well, we had a time at REMS, as you might imagine, with uh, going in and, and get all clean, uh, mincing all of these uh, fish heads, fish brains, and putting them around. and. Um, 
finally the big day came and uh, we went into the county sand headquarters and uh, uh, we said, uh, uh, did you, uh, uh, do you have your data for uh, uh, all of this study? And they said, yeah, here it is. And says, where's yours? And Grim says, well, we didn't have the money to run it. <laughs> So they did, I don't know how much money they spent, it was a lot of money in those days for analyzing thousands of, uh, of uh, these fish heads. And of course it was uh, heavily used in the lawsuit against County Sand to get, the, get them disconnected from, uh, from Montrose Chemical. Now talking about um, sanitation districts yeah. and uh, the whole process that occurred in the mid 80s that we now know has really rather s been rather successfully, reasonably successfully resolved with the, the new sewage treatment plant. And in, there, was, there, was, there was a whole process that happened in Ventura County that I want you to talk about. Well, Ventura was uh, the, the shootout. Uh, what happened was it was LA County sand that when the uh, Clean, Clean Water Act was passed back in 1970, said, uh, uh, or into that when we were at them to go to full secondary treatment, to actually treat sewage discharge rather than uh, just uh, uh, chewing it up and shooting it out in the ocean uh, to actually remove all the bad stuff from, to treat it, secondary treatment as it's called. And uh, County San applied for and got an exemption, a section H of uh, 301, 301H waivers that said uh, under certain conditions you wouldn't have to do this. And led by County San, uh, sanitation districts all over the country got these waivers, applied for and got the waivers. What year? What time? Oh, golly, that? this is um, late 70s, mm -hmm. late 70s. And uh, no, it wasn't, it was early as, gee whiz. Six, it, was in the, it was in 1970 ish, about 1970. Mm -hmm. And uh, the um, one of those. Well, nationwide, uh, NRDC and the Riverkeeper and, and a lot of big uh, green organizations had been fighting this. Austin Harbor is a classic huge fight over the 301H waiver. NRDC lost. The waiver was upheld. And uh, so we said, well, you know, we're about to head into a fight with the city of Los Angeles over the Hyperion treatment plant. And there's this little city of Oxnard that also and theirs, they were already at full secondary. They were yeah. using, they were already treating their sewage. And they looked around at everybody else and said, well, we want to apply for a waiver too. We'll save all this money if we can do like Los Angeles and Boston and all the rest of these. So uh, they, uh, we played a little bit of a trick on them. Uh, I had a, a, a lawyer that knew absolutely nothing about uh, the Clean Water Act or, uh, or Section 301. Uh, but owed me a favor, and uh, so we hired him to represent us in this thing, and we're in front of an administrative law judge, which is, can be whatever they want. It doesn't have to be a formal court proceeding. And uh, they, uh, Michael Brush, his name was, got into a luffing match with the uh, uh, young lady who was the attorney for uh, the sanitation district, who, and they'd have lunch together and talk about the case and all the rest, and we had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with what was going on. We had Rim, and Rim went through, and we talk about Brock Bernstein too, one of the one of the folks that never worked again uh, uh, because he testified uh, for us. But we put together a really solid case to show that uh, when Orange, when Oxnard started discharging uh, the adverse impact on the ocean, when they went to full secondary, how the ocean cleaned up. And then a projection of what would happen again. And if you have to uh, preserve the existing uh, 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 indigenous species, whatever that might mean biologically, uh, we were really laying for them. And uh, uh, Michael and the, and the young lady who was the attorney representing uh, Oxnard uh, smiled and came in in front of the judge. And the judge says, uh, what? Uh, and Rem, just tore them apart. Judge uh, ruled, uh, denied their 301H waiver and wrote, based on RIM's uh, documentation, a really great opinion 
Mm -hmm. And based on that, uh, we started winning 301H waivers all over the country, starting, really? in, l starting in Los Angeles, right all next door. Uh, Boston got its waiver reversed and, and, and denied that it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was really a huge thing uh, because we found uh, one guy that couldn't be bought and was willing to uh, assemble the data and show exactly. And I'd like to mention again here that RIM was a lifeguard for 50 years. And, and why I want to mention it here too was that in back in those days, in the mid 80s, mm -hmm. we were seeing studies where lifeguards were coming up with cancer at just mm. appalling rates, Pico, horrifying rates. Pico Kenter Drain, uh, there was one particular lifeguard station that nobody wanted to get assigned to because everybody that, that went to work there came down with cancer. And, uh, you know, this is uh, ad hoc ergo propter hoc. It's, uh, just coincidental, right? But nobody mm -hmm. wanted to work there, and mm -hmm. pretty soon Rim says, you know, something's going on. It, it isn't just coincidence, something's going on here, and started actually looking at the water, mm -hmm. and uh, found out, of course, it was, uh, uh, and it brought about a second thing, because up till that time, we had all thought that the big problem was all a sewage discharge. And Rim brought it to our attention that storm drains also carry a horrible toxic load out. And the Pico Kenner storm drain, which is right where this lifeguard station is, happens to be one of the most toxic reaches uh, uh, runoff uh, coming in. And uh, RIM uh, was able to show the direct connection between the discharge from the storm drain and the people that were getting uh, cancer out in front. It was a huge thing that uh, Heal the Bay has relied on ever since for their uh, uh, rather successful program. It led to uh, TMDLs and uh, mm -hmm. Sue Sumps and all these uh, regulations now that uh, we have to control uh, surface runoff. Mm -hmm. which, which is major. And, and uh, finally, we have uh, an effort in on that drain to uh, Process that 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 stormwater, right? That's, yes. That's, that's really the first one in LA County, isn't it? Uh, well, they're pr pretty much doing that at the same time all over. They are. Uh, but uh, and you know somebody would have figured it out sooner or later that uh, it's not safe to swim in the in the ocean you know, within four days of uh, a rainstorm and that never go swimming right in front of these storm drains, uh, particularly in an urban area. Mm -hmm. But uh, Rim happened to be the one that figured it out first. And a more important thing, everybody else is beholden to the large developers on shore. And uh, Rim, uh, being an old diver, said, you know, every time I come to the surface out in the Santa Monica Bay and uh, look back toward the, toward the beach, he says, all I can see is 14 million anal sphincters looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, we're gonna <laughs> move right along from that joke. Uh, I've, a, I've heard a couple a, others that's like not it. A, not a joke. <laughs> this is uh, this is the truth. That's what we're looking at. Well, there was at. at that time in the 80s. The um, it was something like the fifth largest river in California was yeah. the river of sewage yeah. coming out of the city of Los Angeles. That's correct. And so the the denial of the 301H waiver to the city of Los Angeles yeah. then re uh, s stimulated the bond election that created the full secondary treatment the yeah. new sewage treatment plant and fortunately it's uh, it's been much cleaner ever since it has it, in fact uh, virtually immediately of course uh, as we said the water column cleared up and the fish started to come back we still have a problem with uh, contaminated sediments out there and rims work uh, back in the, in the 60s and 70s on contaminated sediments is still quoted today as, uh, and, uh, and we still haven't solved the problem. Here it is 40 years later and we still got the same problem. Mm -hmm. Right as we speak, uh, one of the issues that came up is they just discovered that uh, the, at the mouth of the LA River, uh, 500,000 cubic yards of sandbar under the uh, Queensway Bridge 
is uh, so contaminated that uh, nothing can survive. You know, they have a test they use for bio, biohazard. And uh, if you don't, if, uh, if uh, 95% of the fish you put in water that's stirred up with this contaminant, if 95% don't survive, uh, it's called toxic. And there's 0.5% uh -huh. survive the sandbar. That, so that's, that's the same problem. Uh, you know, we still haven't solved it. But RIM's data and RIM's uh, cognition that, it's, uh, that what flows off the streets and uh, into, the, into the ocean uh, is killing things out there has led to uh, a lot of the law. And a lot of it was uh, in the, got into the Clean Water Act because of, uh, of things that uh, folks like not only REM, but REM and others uh, put back in the late 60s uh, in to get the Clean Water Act passed. The other thing that, that he uh, suggested too was looking at, uh, you know, this happens over and over again, say at Hyperion, where with the Ocean Fish Protective Association that was so concerned Hyperion's about- Hyperion's the sewage treatment plant. Correct. For the city of Los Angeles. And in the 50s, uh, based on the, the obvious problems, uh, and this is Rim's father that was involved in a fight that got the first secondary treatment facility in the United States built at really? Hyperion. Handled uh, 100 million gallons a day. Well, by the early 60s, when uh, uh, I was uh, first really doing things with RIM, uh, they'd really gone way past that. They were, had 120, 150, 200, 400, 500 million gallons. Well, that means you're only treating 20% of it. And what do you know, the problems all came back, and here we go again. So uh, that was, uh, and this time they're asking for a waiver to uh, not, not uh, or got a waiver to, uh, uh, not uh, not have to go to full secondary and only partial secondary. So the RIM said, you know, we go through this cycle over and over again, it's really the wrong way. You gotta treat it up at the beginning. You gotta take the water before, and before it gets contaminated with all the industrial stuff, mm -hmm. when it's just domestic waste, mm -hmm. uh, clear up in the San Fernando Valley and catch it up there, catch it in the outskirts and build the tertiary treatment plants that'll scrub it up to potable water quality and send the bad stuff all down to, the, down to Hyperion. Well, that's uh, what has been done and uh, with the uh, treatment plants uh, up at the, the um, Tillman, in Tillman of course. That's another thing I really have to say, it's always the guys that fight the hardest to stop environmental laws or work the hardest to get exemptions. They're always the ones that the parks get named after. And the <laughs> <laughs> well, this brings up the May Maxim, you know? Do you know what the May Maxim is? What's the May We Maxim? quote it all the time. What's this? You can do the work or you can get the credit. <laughs> oh, that's exactly right. That's exactly Named right. Named after you, Don May, <laughs> who first introduced us to the May Maxim. Well, it's the case. Well, we're here to uh, create a little bit of a uh, public record on who did the work. And that was Rimmon C. Fay, PhD. Yeah. We just have a couple minutes left. And uh, it's been another swift half hour. And uh, do you have a, 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 a short story you'd like to a tell? A short one? <laughs> Gee whiz. I, you know, How about was, the anniversary of the, thir the 30th anniversary of the, the Coastal Commission? That was, you know, that's, uh, all of us have uh, a different remembrance of who did what uh, uh -huh. at, uh, well, uh, back in the, the Prop 20 days when we were fighting to get a Coastal Act back in 1970. But um, I think that uh, all of us that were doing the campaign in LA County remember Rim and, uh, and his uh, dissertations on the beach. And Pacific Biomarine was uh, a great place to bring school kids because you had mm -hmm. all these tanks full and Rim would explain where they came from and introduce you to this critter on a first name basis. This is what he does for a living. He lives here and this is how he makes his, he makes his uh, earns his, his food and how he disposes of his waste and how he fits in and how it all works together. Kids would come out 
and not just kids, of course. You take the city council people and the assemblymen and the senators out there and show them uh, from RIM's viewpoint of how the world all works to, and, the, and why it is that the things they're doing on development here on the coast is having such a terrible impact on his ocean out there. RIM, uh, despite all of his awards and that, was always a uh, very humble guy. And it, when he'd be introduced at uh, some of these hearings and that, uh, he'd always say, uh, you know, I'm just a simple fisherman and spend my time out in the ocean. But, uh, you know, if you're going to restore an estuary, don't you think you should get it a little closer to the ocean when this happened to be one that was going? It was some simple thing that and everybody says, of course, you know, why, why is it so clear to him? And why didn't everybody see that? Why didn't everybody see that? Well, well he had the, he, he did have the, you know, the blessing of having grown up on the ocean, in the ocean, with a father who understood, and then had that, the great benefit of um, many years of higher education studying the ocean. And he and gave that. And we didn't that. have you, Janet, and, well, and, uh, <laughs> and, a, and a video cameras to take the story to the world. I wish we had. Viewers, thank you very much again for visiting with us and, and uh, hearing the stories of uh, another one of the heroes of the coast, Ruman C. Fay. Don, thank you again for joining us. A real delight. Um, for more information, you'll see uh, our email address and website, and uh, we'd be happy to respond to any questions. But uh, again, thank you very much for joining us.